much of an introduction, but uh, I will uh, give you some of the academic uh, things that you might need to know about uh, Dr. John All. But uh, what, what a great testament to science, to uh, the pursuit of solutions and re re remediation for climate change and global warming. Uh, but uh, John All is, is a great example of what many of our faculty are doing uh, to pursue solutions to the environmental issues of our day. Dr. John All is a, a geoscientist whose life has been devoted to exploration around the world as he examines how climate change and resource management interact to impact communities and the biosphere in the mountainous regions of our globe. He is currently an associate professor of environmental geography at WKU, as well as the co-founder and executive director of the American Climber Science Program. Dr. All is interested in expanding our understanding of climate change impacts on the biosphere in remote locations and identifying ways in which resource management can inform climate change adaptation more broadly. He began his career with a focus on exploring the Colorado River Delta and the Sierra Madre of northern uh, Mexico as part of his PhD research. He found similar environmental issues in southern Africa in the Okavango Delta and helped to map the poorly understood Greater Chobe River system. He has extensive experience in Nepal and Peru and uses his JD to examine policy res uh, responses and inform local conservation decision making. Dr. All has led expeditions on five continents in extreme locations from deep crevasses to tropical rainforests, deserts, and the world's highest mountains. He has led explorations to climb Mount Everest and numerous other noteworthy peaks across the world. John All is a lifetime fellow of the Explorers Club of New York City, a member of the IUCN Mountain Protected Areas Network, a committee member for geography and, ge and geology uh, with the American Association for the Advancement of Science for the past 11 years. He's been also on the American Alpine Club's Conservation Committee, and he has co-led ACSP expeditions to Peru in 2012 and 2013, Costa Rica, and Nepal. And it is a pleasure as the president of Western Kentucky University to present to you for our Idea Festival 2015, Dr. John All, adventurous and scientist. Thank you. Well, obviously, I did get out, and uh, that was one of the worst days of my life. But I survived because my life and everything I had done up to that point had prepared me for um, what I needed to do in order to move forward. And so what I want to do today is tell you about that journey and the things I've learned in terms of how you can bridge uh, the university and uh, things you learn that may not seem like they're going to be relevant for climbing mountains and how when you apply them in the real world, they'll help you solve problems and succeed in various things. Um, I've gone to, I've got a law degree, business school, PhD, so I've studied a lot of different things, and in those, I've seen common threads. Uh, a good example is the environmental impact statement that uh, is required for federal uh, actions, and you think, ah, oh, environmental impact statement, that doesn't sound very interesting, what about mountains? But the key with that, those types of academic exercises is they tell you you have to inventory your environment, look at what's around you. You have to um, choose courses of action and weigh them based on their costs and benefits. And then you make decisions and move forward with them. And all, that type of learning has helped me as I've moved through expeditions around the world. And I've led expeditions to the top of Mount Everest, but also uh, uh, been to northern India collecting data, and uh, Costa Rica, the home of the banana, and Africa. And uh, the reason I'm able to do all these things is because I um, am in the geography department. We study how the environment is changing around the world and how humans are affecting it and being affected by it. And that requires us to get out in the world and do things. Um, for me personally, uh, what I've done is created something called the American Climber Science Program. And um, what that does is I pull together a bunch of different scientists of different types from around the world, and we go and we do expeditions together. So these two guys are physicists from the University of Nevada, Reno, and they're studying the glaciers. I have toxicologists from the University of Washington studying water quality. And um, 
tropical ecologists studying the plants. And each of those gets together and we all work together to study the environment and look and see what's happening to the uh, world. Uh, one of the main things I do is I have to help train people because a lot of scientists aren't used to going into the mountains. And so helping people pursue their dreams is what, again, gave the impetus for this talk. How can you uh, see something you want and move forward and successfully achieve it in a dangerous location? Um, work with students. Uh, these are three uh, people from the University of Washington, two students and a faculty member. And for all of them, it was their first time they'd ever summited a peak. So it was a dream they realized, but it was also they were able to collect water quality data the entire way up. And so uh, work on uh, master's degrees while they were climbing and reaching some of these dreams. Uh, and the reason I work in Africa and other places is um, I feel like it, in the United States, we're very blessed. And so we have a duty to help other people um, achieve things and conserve their environment when they don't have as much money or time or uh, scientific expertise. Hopefully the thing, ah, there we go. And so what this has meant is that I spend a lot of time in some really uh, dangerous places. I don't know if you can see, but there's three little climbers over here. Um, we're trying to come up and around these crevasse fields. The world's mountains are melting very quickly. Climate change is occurring. And we're out there on the front lines trying to measure those changes. And with the danger comes beauty. I mean, some of the most incredible things you're ever going to see. And at the end of the day, what you want is something that's going to give you joy. And that's what we uh, that's the way I feel when I get up on the mountains and find that data and learn about what's going on and summit a peak. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. And so hopefully I can help you guys um, um, pursue some of your goals and find out uh, how to achieve some of your dreams. So these are the lessons learned. And you don't memorize this slide. I'm going to show it to you a bunch of times throughout the talk. Um, but the key with it is, is what you want to do Create goals or dreams, depending on if you call them goals if you're in business school, you call them dreams if you're in your own real life. Um, you want to learn how to achieve those goals. Find the right people to work with on them. Figure out how efficiently to meet those goals and then move forward recognizing dangers but still move forward with them. So I will go through each one of these over the course of these uh, slides. But first I want to give you a little more background on that. Uh, crevasse story, because you may have said, well, what's he doing? Why is he by himself in the bottom of a crevasse? Um, this past year, I led a research team on Mount Everest. Uh, we went to collect data on climate change and uh, pollution on the glaciers. So how does that affect how quickly they melt um, and so forth? Uh, unfortunately, it was a terrible year. A lot of people died this year. Uh, the glaciers, again, are melting very quickly. And so the ravens are ominous. But if you can see, it's kind of difficult uh, with the light. There's a, a rescue helicopter right there. And unfortunately, this was one of the worst disasters in Mount Everest's history, if not the worst. Um, we were here to sample the snow. So there's this, um, at about 22,000 feet, there's this uh, valley, a nice flat valley with lots of snow. We were going to climb up here, sample snow here, here. This is Mount Everest, and this is Lhotse. So we're going to take samples on both sides. But unfortunately, in order to get to this nice looking valley, uh, you have to go through the Kumbu Icefall. And that's a river of ice where the glacier is disintegrating and melting and rolling and moving. And every day it changes. And it's very dangerous. And so it's one of those things where throughout the history of climbing Mount Everest, people have had to surmount this uh, difficulty. And so what you do is. Hopefully what you do, there we go, is you, before you begin climbing, you have what's called a puja, where a Buddhist priest from Tibet comes and prays with you and asks the mountain effectively to let you live. And you put up these prayer flags uh, to bless the tents and so forth and bless your efforts. So this is a small video from our puja that year. Um, we did the puja on April 17th, which is one of the holiest uh, days in Buddhism. Um, in the hopes of, you know, again, asking the mountain not to kill us. And it's a long ceremony, and it, again, purifies us, our equipment and everything, and makes us ready to climb. But unfortunately, 
the uh, mountain didn't listen. And so as people were going along through here, a uh, avalanche came down and killed a lot of people. And the biggest problem was that this ladder right here across a crevasse fell. And so my team was out there in the middle of the ice fall um, as this was unfolding. And so um, my friend Ann Kami took this picture, um, but you can see the bottleneck. And so all these people were waiting to try and get through and the avalanche hit right there. So almost everyone in this picture is dead. And that tragedy racked all of us. And so after the ice fall, we spent the day gathering up bodies and bringing them down the mountain. Um, mainly helicoptering them down. Carrying bodies off of the mountain is a very difficult thing to do. Um, sorry, I have a really big presentation, so. Uh, this is my friend Ashman uh, Tamang. You can see his body as it came down the mountain. It was really, really difficult. So that's one of the risks you face when you pursue your dream. Sometimes it doesn't work, but most of the time it does. It, just try not to be picked too dangerous a dream, I guess. Um, these were my friends. All of them were caught in the avalanche. Ashman, uh, thankfully, was the only person who died, but he left behind a wife and a nine-month-old daughter. Um, so we've been raising funds to try and help uh, his daughter get through school and do a lot of the other things that she'll need to do in life without a father. Um, but in the weeks afterwards, we spent a lot of time together uh, contemplating the tragedy, deciding whether or not to climb. Uh, a lot of meetings were held in base camp. Unfortunately, it became a political question. Um, the Communist Party in Nepal has a lot of power in the mountains, and they saw the opportunity to try and seize more power by closing the mountain. And so they told us they would break our legs if we didn't leave. They beat up a bunch of the Sherpas, my friends. And so eventually everyone was forced off the mountain. Um, this year, unfortunately, it looks even worse. The Communist Party has declared a strike. And so they're not going to allow any of the climbers to get to base camp even. Um, so they're going to block people in Kathmandu. It's really interesting to see what's going to happen. That's one of the reasons we decided not to go uh, this year is because we feared um, what was going to happen with this political situation. So we had to leave behind base camp and Everest and try to move forward. Um, but Ashman had already sacrificed his life. We'd all pushed ourselves. And, you know, we're studying the canary in the coal mine. We're, we're looking at the cutting edge of science and trying to figure out what's happening to the world's glaciers. The Himalayas provide water for 2 billion people. And so we can't just walk away. So we wanted to try and do what we could to uh, continue collecting data. The problem is, is the Asian monsoon was coming. So we had a short window, maybe 10 days left. Um, at most. And so we chose a peak that we could climb. This is Mount Himlung. Uh, it's on the Tibet-Nepal border. And we moved up collecting uh, data. You can see the uh, two climbers. So we climbed up and around and uh, through. And we had gotten to 20,000 feet, established Camp 2. And at this point, there was only three of us left. People had gotten sick. Um, the tragedy on Everest had we, uh, whittled off some of our team, and so there was only three of us left, and one of the people got sick. And so another, the other teammate decided to accompany her down so she could recover a little bit, and they would come back in a few days. But we only had a couple days left before the monsoon hit. So we had reached this point, and the question was, did I do something dangerous and stay there alone by them myself collecting data, or did I go down? And I made the decision to stay up there and continue collecting data. And that way, when they returned, when she was feeling better, we'd have that work done and we could continue moving forward. And it's one of those things that's easy to second guess, but at the same time, you know, hindsight's 2020, so you can't, again, all you can do is just prepare as well as you can. And of course, I fell down into the crevasse. And um, thankfully, and you can see my foot. I fell right here, one foot this way, and I would have continued down another 100, 200 feet. Um, so life is lucky, and uh, so I had to climb out. You saw the video of uh, how I climbed out. 
And what I learned, a lot of people tell me, I wouldn't have been able to climb out of there. How did you do that? Everyone will do what it takes to survive. I didn't think I could climb out of there either, but um, there's a, a voice inside you that's going to push you forward, and that voice is going to come from your friends and your family, and you're going to get strength from that. And so when things hit you in life that make it difficult, recognize that you're a lot tougher than you think you are. And so I was able to climb out of that crevasse. And then I had to climb back down to my tent. So this is what I was looking at. Um, you think, oh, yeah, that's 15 minutes. It took me 15 minutes to walk up there. It took me over two hours to crawl back down. And then once I made it there and was able to call out for help, um, I had to wait another 19 hours for the helicopter to come. And the problem was I was bleeding internally. I didn't know this when I was climbing out. I had six broken vertebrae. I still have six broken vertebrae. I had six broken ribs, my shoulder, my arm, my clavicle. They were all broken, um, bleeding all over the place, inside and outside. I guess about half my chest cavity had filled with blood by the time I got to the hospital. So when that helicopter finally arrived, it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Um, they finally got me to the hospital. And um, I was in a little newspaper here and there. And then somehow my videos became viral. And uh, CNN, BBC, People Magazine um, got some fame from this. Um, and people ask me, well, you've done all these great adventures. You were famous. Tell us some other stories you have. And what I try and tell people is you don't want a story. A friend of mine is married to a cop, and she always says that the best day is a boring day because that means no one got shot. And that's what you want. You want the boring days. You want everything to go just right. We went in, we gathered our data, we came home. No um, stories involved. Um, you, and the only way you can do that is by seeing what dangers lurk underneath where you're at. Um, and you may look at this and say, oh, hippopotamuses, they're cute. Uh, where we were at, hippopotamuses kill more people than any other uh, wildlife in Africa. There's a lot of things that kill you, so um, we'll talk more about that later. But um, I've led so many expeditions and been through so many dangerous, dangerous places. <laughs> and um, you know, maybe I got a little complacent when I was facing that crevasse. But at the same time, I believe I probably would have done the same thing. Um, because that's what the science demanded. That's what we needed to do. That's my dream is to collect that data. So what are the lessons learned? I'll we'll come back to these now and uh, go through them one at a time and talk about them. Uh, the first one is, what is your dream? What is your goal? You have to decide what it is you want to pursue. And what I found in life is you can't pursue a lot of dreams. If you want to be a ballerina or an artist or a photographer, Whatever, uh, if you want to have a family, whatever it is that you dream of doing, you can only pick a few of those things. And so you got to make sure that what you pick, you believe in. Um, you want to learn as many skills as you can to, uh, to uh, help you achieve those, that dream. You want to find the right team. And it doesn't have to be the best people. It's the people you trust, the people you want to spend time with. Um, then once you decide on what you want to do, you want to uh, scan your environment. You want to figure out, uh, take an inventory. If it was an environmental impact statement, we'd call it inventory of the environment. You, know, you want to know what the opportunities are and the risks. And then once you've decided that, you um, plan uh, how you can uh, efficiently, most efficiently achieve those things and then move forward, again, recognizing the danger that's there. So the first thing is a dream, and really this is the most important thing. And if you can take one thing away from this talk, it's that you've got to have a, dreams in your life that really are worth um, pursuing. And for mountaineers, you know, it's easy for us. We see the uh, beautiful peaks in the background, and we want to climb them. Um, and, but you can't climb them until you first dream of climbing them. And you, you want to start with a big dream. If you dream of owning a Honda, then you're going to get a Honda. If you dream of owning a Ferrari, then that's a much bigger dream, and it's going to push you harder, and you're going to have to work more to achieve it, but it's a much bigger and more rewarding dream in the end. Your, most importantly, your dream is something that has to be something that makes you jump for joy. It has to be something that you're passionate about, that you believe in. And for me, that dream was always Mount Everest. When I was a kid, 
I read accounts about it and saw pictures of people climbing it and thought it was the most incredible thing. It's the most wonderful mountain. And when I was in 2009, 2010, I received a Fulbright grant to go and teach in Nepal and do research. And while I was there, I began studying the mountain and visiting it from all of its different sides, looking at how beautiful it was and the different ways to climb it. And I realized that was my dream. So then the question becomes, how do you achieve that dream? How, how do you go about doing it? And you've got to gather knowledge. You know, it's going to take money. It's going to take drive. It's going to take determination. And one of the key things to remember is that chasing the dream itself is where you're going to find most of those rewards because it's going to force you to walk new paths that you didn't expect to walk before and make new friends. Um, if you're curious, this is what an elephant's footprint looks like compared to a human's footprint. And I never would have learned things like that if I hadn't begun exploring new environments and pushing myself forward. Um, this is one of my favorite places to camp on Earth. I, every time I go to Peru, I go here, and it's about 20,000 feet. But every night, the sunset looks like this. You're looking out over the Pacific Ocean, um, through the mountains, and every time, it's incredibly beautiful. And sunsets are something that I've uh, appreciated on, that on these journeys. But of course, sunsets aren't limited to Peru, uh, Mount Everest, Africa like this. Uh, again, the beauty that you uh, find while you're pursuing your dream is going to be uh, really important. Uh, this is a shepherd's uh, hut in the Andes. Uh, giraffes, they look like horses with a buzz cut. <laughs> And various things you're going to see that are really exciting and new. Um, this is a stone um, wheel to grind wheat and corn into flour. You would think they quit using these two, three hundred years ago, but in Nepal, in the really remote areas, they're still using them. This is state-of-the-art technology, and it's something else that you have learned in my travels. <laughs> So bicycle wheels on wagons being pulled by ox carts, tractors pulling wagons. So many different things you learn. This is in Tibet. So many different things you can see when you're pursuing your dream. So the key is that whatever you want to do should be something more than you already are. It should make you grow. It should be something you're reaching for and you're not sure that you're going to make it. Um, as leader of the Climber Science Program, I've helped so many people reach towards their dreams, and the ones who are most satisfied are the ones who didn't think they could do it. And then when they do do it, they realize, you know, this is wonderful. This is what life should be. Um, this uh, woman was a student in New York City uh, as an accountant, but she really wanted to be a mountain guide. So she just came with us one summer, spent the summer climbing, learning how to guide, learning how to move safely in the mountains. Now she works for the American Alpine Club in Colorado and couldn't be happier. Um, this team included an artist from New York City, a, a lawyer, students, all kinds of people uh, reaching for their first peak. Um, I love this picture because this my friend James was a, is a, uh, a, a banker on Wall Street. And same thing, he wanted to climb. And um, so he's come with us to Peru every year for four years now. And he's gone from not being able to climb at all to thinking about climbing Mount Everest. So slowly growing the dream over time. And the determination is really what makes a difference. For me, I had sprained my knee really badly, bloodied it up during a uh, bicycle accident less than a year before I got ready to um, go to Nepal. And so I had to make that decision. Did I want to push? Did I want to rehab more quickly? Did I want to lift weights more than I was going to feel comfortable doing in order to reach for that dream to go back to Everest? And I decided yes. And that's what it takes to achieve a lot of these things is that determination. You've got to want what you're going to uh, aim for. Because a lot of times you're going to get tired. You're going to, it's going to be hard. Things are going to get in your way. And uh, it's going to be dangerous. So this is only about a foot and a half wide and probably 5,000 foot drop. And unfortunately, we hit it during a snowy storm. If it had been uh, pleasant conditions, it would have been easier. But that didn't mean we could turn back. Because if you can uh, fight through a lot of these things, then you're going to reach that dream. And you're going to 
reach the summit. And that's the most important thing is the realization of what you can do. I love this picture because this guy's 72 and she's 18. Um, both of them, this was their first peak. And this was something they had wanted to do for a long time. She's uh, since then has become a climber, is going to school at the University of Colorado now. Um, and Clinton Lewis is even better. I don't know if Clinton's in the audience, but he's told this story before, so I'll tell it. I love this picture because this is 2013. In 2011, he tried to climb this mountain, which is called a Shinka, and he failed. And the reason was because he wasn't prepared. He came to the mountain um, not knowing what to expect, not having trained, not mentally being ready for the pressure and the uh, stress it was going to cause. But his dream was to be uh, validated and to climb the mountain. And so he spent the next two years training mentally, physically, studying climbing books. And so when he went back in 2014, he was able to climb a bunch of peaks. And we had summit celebrations uh, in a lot of places. And so that realization of the dream, I believe, was a really uh, wonderful experience for him. Um, but it's not just physically that you have to prepare. You've also mentally got to uh, do what you're going to need to do. And a lot of that's going to be learning, because there's nothing you can learn that will uh, detract from you. Um, backpacking, first aid, photography, anything that you learn that makes you more well-rounded, makes you a better person, helps you achieve any dream. And um, the, uh, one of the big reasons is because your mind is the only thing you're going to have with you when you're um, anywhere you go. When I fell in that crevasse, I wasn't prepared to fall in the crevasse. I wasn't climbing. I just had on a light t-shirt, um, just a couple ice axes, no sat phone, no headlamp. But I had my mind and my, my training, and so that was what enabled me to survive. Um, as scientists, that's what we go out to do, is spend a lot of time studying things. Um, everything we learn um, helps us as we move through the environment. Um, we had, can better understand it. Um, solar panels are how we charge all of our equipment. And so simple things like someone who knows how to do electricity. You would think, electricity, how's that going to help me climbing? But it helps you climbing because you can uh, help us work on the solar panels and keep the equipment charged. So any little skill you learn is going to help you in the long run. Uh, of course, medical skills, uh, we have doctors that go with us, but they aren't always there. Medical skills can help you any time in life. Uh, the crevasse training that I talked about before. Um, and the key is that at the end of the day, if you've got all that training, if you feel confident when you're on that knife edge of red, when you're in that dangerous situation, when the bank comes calling and your mortgage is due, you're prepared. You've, uh, you know what you need to do uh, to succeed. So after you've learned, you've figured out your dream, the next thing is who you're going to do it with. And what I've learned is the person with the best resume is usually not the person you want with you. You don't need the smartest person, the one with the most publications, the one who runs the fastest 40-meter time. What you want are people you trust, that you want to spend time with, that you're confident in. And I want to start with not the people you're climbing with, but your support team. Because, you know, here at the university, the professors teach, but you also have people who serve food, who do the landscaping, who help clean up everything. So the entire team is critical to the success of any um, mission. And so that's one of the things that I try to do when you're uh, pursuing these dreams is build a strong relationship with people. Um, and because they're the ones who are going to help you get your supplies up the mountain, um, this is two of my good friends. Ang Kami is the one who took the uh, avalanche pictures. I climbed with him for years. No, his wife, his daughter. You make some really wonderful friendships. Mingma uh, is another great friend. We were coming down off this peak late, um, really late. Uh, the storm had moved in. He was worried about us. So he ran up the glacier in his tennis shoes, no rope, no anything, uh, through the easy part, carrying tea and food because he was worried about us. We were so late. And those types of friendships are wonderful. Uh, one of the best things ever was because I had the satellite phone and I was in contact back in town. So this is Joel and this is his dad, Joaquin. And I, I, because I had the satellite phone, I was able to tell Joel that his wife had had a daughter and that he was a father and that he was a grandfather. And they were both so happy. And uh, we drank a bottle of wine sitting around the fire together. And so you can build those incredibly strong relationships. 
Unfortunately, it goes both ways. You build those strong relationships, and they don't. You also share the the tragedy when things go wrong. So when Ashman died, that was incredible, incredible blow. It still bothers me today. Um, these were two of the people we worked with in Africa. There was about seven or eight people that we worked with very frequently, and um, we went in 2007, and when we went back in 2009, they were all dead. Um, two of them had been killed by elephants. Uh, they had been game guards for us, and they had had uh, automatic weapons, and the elephants killed them even while they were trying to fire their automatic weapons. Um, the other people we had worked with have all, had all died of AIDS. Everyone at this age group, um, including both these guys, that has devastated Botswana and Namibia. And so we came back and started asking about friends, and oh, they're gone, oh, they're gone, oh, they're gone. And so again, that, um, those friendships you build um, can lead to, uh, it's very difficult when tragedy strikes. So why do you have a team? The key with the team is that it makes you stronger, safer. The more synergies you can develop with uh, your teammates, the stronger you become. And the key is as long as everyone does their job and contributes, you're much more likely to survive and triumph. Um, in my case, I've worked with so many great people. You can see 15, 20 people on an expedition of all different ages, all different specialties from all different parts of the country and world. Um, and the key with our success has always been because we're a volunteer organization. Everyone pays their own expenses to come. Everyone's interested in conserving the environment and studying the, uh, the world. And so as a result, it, um, it makes everyone more cooperative. And we have great friendships and great synergies that develop. And some of my closest friends are these people that I've shared these really intense experiences with. Um, you might ask, well, what, what is it that you look for? Again, I, I don't look for the guy with the best IQ and the most publications. Instead, it's somebody who's calm under pressure, someone who's friendly no matter what, who doesn't get sullen and upset. And in order to really demonstrate this, I want to tell you about the most dangerous expedition I've been on. And you're probably thinking, oh, Mount Everest, right? Or maybe Africa. Well, Africa was pretty bad, but it actually was Costa Rica. Um, this is Costa Rica, this is Panama. So the yellow line is the border between the two. And what we were doing was we uh, were on the Pacific and we wanted to collect environmental data. So we uh, sea kayaked along through this gulf. Then we mountain biked through here collecting data. And then the hard part of the trip was we crossed the Talamanca Mountains. So, and then came over and finished up on the Atlantic Ocean. So we crossed from the Pacific to the Atlantic. And these Talamancas hadn't been crossed in over 10 years. There's so much drug activity that the government had just shut it down. They weren't letting scientists or anybody in there. And we were able to get special permission. They really wanted to know what the state of the environment was. So we went and collected soil samples and did a lot of other things. Um, in the lowland areas, when we were mountain biking through, uh, we were collecting information like on roadkill. Um, because the more you know about roadkill, the more you know about how roads affect wildlife corridors and wildlife migration. Um, and our team was not what you would have thought would have led to success. A professional ice climber, a uh, cloud physicist who was an Olympic biathlete, a Navy SEAL, me, a uh, tropical ecologist who was an Olympic cross-country skier, um, and then a Costa Rican scientist. Um, most of these people were winter athletes. They weren't summer, you know, the jungle is not where they had their expertise. But the key is we all worked well together and we had an overlapping skill set that allowed us to move easily. Um, so we did the sea kayaking, collected data, and then we dipped our bikes in the Pacific Ocean and began biking forward. Um, this woman was with us initially and then dropped out. She was a professional cyclist from um, Switzerland, but it was too difficult. And she recognized that she probably wouldn't survive once we got higher up. So we bicycled through the lowland areas collecting data. And then we stepped off into the unknown. When we crossed into the Talamanca Mountains, we realized there was no rescue. If there had been an accident, that person might not have survived. Um, I guess the last time, 15 years before, an expedition had gone through, a guy tripped and embedded a stick in his eye. And it took them three days of walking down the river until they finally reached a point where a helicopter could come and get him. And at that point, of course, he had uh, swollen up and had all these problems. 
So we moved into the jungle very deep, had to hack our way through. Uh, it took us a lot longer than we expected and uh, because no one had been through. The paths were untracked and so forth. And when we finally reached this uh, bridge, this was the first outpost of civilization. But it's only two pieces of three, two pieces of wire up high and one down low. You had to balance. Oh shit! Come on, Carl. <laughs> and you can see we thought we almost lost Carl in the water. And it's only 20, 30 feet down, but uh, that's quite a fall into a river that's going to sweep you away. And um, so we faced danger after danger. We ran out of food because it took us a lot longer. This was a 10 foot long snake skin that we found in our campsite. Um, and it shed it sometime right before we got there. And um, this is the last day before we reached that bridge, before we reached civilization. Again, we haven't, we've been on half rations for the last three or four days. We uh, have been uh, moving nonstop, sweating, collecting data for 16 hours a day. But you can see Alistair, he's smiling, he's having fun. And that's what you want in a teammate, no matter how bad it gets. They have a positive attitude. They're going to contribute, and everyone's going to feel good about being part of that team. So once you've got the team, once you know what you want to do, you're ready to step forward and begin um, looking at your intermediate goals. So um, you need to, again, in, in business, it would be called the inventory or uh, law or the environmental impact statement. Um, I call it scanning your environment. You want to look around and see everything you have to work with. Um, and figure out what you're going to need. Look at, in the case of mountain climbing, look at historic accounts of people who have climbed Mount Everest before. Look at uh, maps and other things that have been published. Um, so for climbing Mount Everest, this is all the gear I brought. So I took all my stuff and spread it around my house. And again, I scanned it. I looked for what would be useful. What did I need? Um, different pairs of boots, different uh, uh, weights of clothing, the sleeping bag. It, you can see the sleeping bag is almost as tall as the bed. It's that thick with insulation. And then once you've decided that, you begin looking at your objectives. And do you want to climb Mount Everest from Tibet on the no longer northern route or from the uh, shorter southern route through Nepal? Each one has different. This one's more deadly. And um, I'm going to finish up the talk talking about this one. This is the one we were on that killed so many people. So um, uh, difficult choices on how to get up. Uh, Google Earth has become a great tool for us. Whenever we're going to a new peak, trying to collect data in new areas, we can pull up a Google Earth image and, uh, again, try and figure out, all right, we're going to set a base camp here, and that'll take us up to the summit. So you're scanning your environment because you don't want to miss that leopard in the trees. You want to identify dangers before you get to them. So with this mountain, uh, this is Alpamaya. We're going to be going back here in uh, a couple months to climb it again. And there's several ways up. Uh, you can, the standard route goes right up here, through here. So you climb along, and then right up here, and then you come to the summit. Um, and then there's other ways up, but they're more dangerous. When I got here in 2012, the, uh, this Serac face was falling down and avalanching, so no one could climb that way. So we decided to go straight up the middle. I thought that looked like the safer route, and it was. We were able to summit successfully. You can see here's a bunch of climbers doing the same thing. So you come up, weave through. Um, but by studying, the, uh, by studying it in advance, figuring out where we wanted to go, that was how we succeeded. This is on Mount Everest. This is looking at the South Coal from the, so Mount Everest from the Tibet side. So again, using my camera, going through and zooming in, looking at where the climbers are at, what looks like the safe places to go. Originally, the route had gone this way, or no, it's over here a little bit further. Originally, the route had gone this way, but an avalanche killed a bunch of people. And so we had to begin climbing this way. So again, identifying that danger and moving away from it looking through all the different risks and possibilities as you move forward and in order to get up to this South Coal, which is our next camp. So studying where you're going, studying the environment. So this is one of my pictures that scares me the most. And the reason is because Joaquin, Joel, and I were all studying this mountain, trying to figure out how we're going to climb it. And the standard route came this way. But there were all these seracs overhead, and we didn't feel safe about it. So we talked and talked and talked and decided that the best way to climb was going to be to come up through here, around, and then come this way to the summit. So 
So begin climbing. There was a little snowfall the night before. Conditions were great, though. There shouldn't have been a problem. Uh, we begin climbing, and I come up, and I just, I won't go this way. Some, for some reason, I just can't force myself to do it. And I stay over here in the rock, and my partner's like, what are you doing? You know, it's much harder climbing over here, and I climb up through here, and we get to about here, and suddenly this entire face collapses. And 50 feet away, the mountain is pouring down beneath us. And it's like, I'm glad we didn't go that way. We obviously, it was the wrong way, but we're really scared now. And then this entire face comes off and sweeps down, and it literally was from that chair to me. Tons and tons, hundreds of tons of ice. And if we had been on our route through here, they never would have found our bodies. We would have been utterly consumed by the avalanche. And so I learned when your gut tells you not to do something, when something feels wrong, you don't do it. <laughs> and that is probably a closer call I had than even in the crevasse. Um, some dangers are obvious. We go into Angola, we cross the border. Uh, you can see the burnout Soviet and US military hel helicopters on both sides of the border. You know there's landmines everywhere. We basically just walk where elephants have walked because we figure if they've stepped there, they've set off any landmines. Um, other dangers are less obvious. Here we're crossing a bridge in Botswana and um, you, know, you look and you think your only worry is if the bridge collapses, but if you look around, uh, again, the hippopotami are waiting, so when you fall into the water and try and get out to push your truck out, uh, there's all kinds of things waiting to, uh, to get you. So after you've scanned the environment, you've figured out what you're doing, the next thing is you want to plan your resources, figure out what do I have to work with and how can I efficiently use limited resources, because there's never enough people, there's certainly never enough money, and so you've got to figure out how you can achieve as much as possible with as limited amount of resources as possible. And um, so this is going to be your logistics. Um, here, we're sitting here. We actually got caught in a really bad snowstorm, so we just sort of threw up a tarp and a tent, and we're trying to eat and cook and everything in really miserable conditions. Um, and the key is making sure you've got adequate resources. So after the uh, Everest part of our expedition collapsed, we came back. This is Namche Bazaar in Peru, in Peru and Nepal. And uh, this is where you buy your supplies. And so we went through, bought the supplies we were going to need for Himlong, and uh, in these areas, there's no roads, uh, so everything has to be can uh, carried up by hand. And so the local people even, when they need something like a whisk broom, um, it has to be carried up by hand. I call these the semis of the uh, Himalayas because they're carrying 100-pound loads and walking all the goods and services up, or I guess not services, goods that you're going to need up the mountain. And you're constantly past them. And you'll also see yaks. And so planning this type of logistics is critical because you want to be able to do it as efficiently as possible. Uh, one of the things that get, gets uh, caught us off guard in Costa Rica was we thought Costa Rica is a sunny country. I told you how all of our research equipment and everything's done by solar. The problem is deep in that jungle, you don't get nearly as much light as you think you would. And so every time we stopped, we would have to search for little bright spots and uh, try and power our equipment. So simple logistics that you don't think through uh, can sometimes cause you problems. And that really leads me to fear, because you have to recognize that things will go wrong and plan for those as well. Um, fear is what keeps us alive. That's why we evolved fear. Um, one of the best examples I've had of this, I have of this, it was uh, Hurricane Katrina. A week before Hurricane Katrina hit uh, New Orleans, a professor, another geography professor, um, was working there and he said, you know, if a category one hurricane actually does strike New Orleans, you know, if, if Hurricane Katrina is a category one when it hits New Orleans and it does hit New Orleans, then hundreds of people can die. There's going to be millions of dollars in losses. The, new, the press went ballistic. They were like, you're fear mongering. How can you make people panic like this? And uh, all of his ideas were shot down. Uh, whereas, in fact, he underestimated the damage and underestimated the number of lives lost. And if people had listened to him, maybe the, some of those thousands of people who died wouldn't have died. And afterwards, no one apologized or anything to him. But now we've changed how we approach um, hurricane uh, events in this country. Um, a simple thing on the uh, coast to coast, uh, Costa Rican expedition, I started losing my sole on my boot. 
and I didn't have any spare shoes. If I had lost that, I'd have gone barefoot, and I might not have survived. It would have slowed me down. It would have slowed the team down. And I mean, you think a simple thing like that, but it literally could have meant uh, the difference between life and death. Thankfully, someone had some glue. We had some duct tape. And I had to duct tape my boots up to get out. Uh, crevasses, I've studied crevasses. We collect data in crevasses. And um, yeah, I climbed over them so you can see leading through past them. Um, and again, maybe that was one of the reasons I was more complacent than I could have been. Um, and the key that I've learned is you've got to see dangers as they occur. Uh, heading up to Mount Everest, there's all these stones with prayers planted, uh, carved on them. And what these stones are is uh, people who have survived, who are saying thanks for letting me survive, and anyone who walks past them is getting blessed on their way up to the mountain. And so you see these and think, oh, that's really wonderful. But you also notice these poles. And when I ask what the poles were with the prayer flags, it turns out that those are burial markers. So if you die on Mount Everest, your ashes get put there, and then a pole is placed with uh, prayer flags on it to, to spread the, your, uh, again, the karma that you've accumulated over the course of your life. And as you begin moving up, you see more and more of these poles, and you realize the danger as you get closer. Um, this is a Chorten, and so it's a uh, larger burial place. But same thing, you see multiple ones of these as you get closer to the mountains. And so you learn respect for where you're going. And the key is not to let that beautiful sunset distract you from what's going to wander through your campsite or what's hiding in the trees or hiding in the grass or <laughs> not hiding very well in the grass but still in the grass. Uh, because these dangers are always around you. you know, a, a car accident, a, uh, anything that might, uh, you know, medical problems. And they're going to creep up when you least expect it. The economy can turn. You can lose your job. And so the better prepared you are, the more resilient you are, the better able you are, will be to weather those storms. So if you have a financial buffer and potentially you lose your job, you're more ready for it. Insurance, those sorts of things. Um, in our case, uh, in Africa, fire creeps up a lot, something we had to deal with. Storms, you wanted to be prepared for. So you can see how this tent, everything's tied down really super strong. Um, our tent wasn't tied down as well. We were in a hurry, and we didn't do everything we needed to do, and it got crushed. Thankfully, we were able to dig it out and reuse it. But this other guy was climbing with us. He gets a little higher. His tent was destroyed, and there was no way to repair it. So he literally walked up, he looked at us, we all stared at each other, we turned around and left, and he turned around and left because his expedition was over, he couldn't go any further. And even when you think things look picturesque and nice and everything, again, you're not sure when you know, medical problems are going to arise. Um, everything seemed fine, we were getting ready to move up the mountain, this was my partner Ed, and um, suddenly someone's appendix burst. Um, that, Things like that happen, and you have to be prepared for them. And in this case, we were able to get him down the mountain in time, and somehow we, we thought he was going to die. I mean, an appendix bursting that far from uh, help, he wouldn't think he would survive. But we put him on oxygen, put him on a stretcher. Uh, our friends, the, the Sherpas are a lot stronger than I am, so I didn't help, um, carried him, and they took turns trading off every five minutes. They would run. The next person would grab a hold of the stretcher. They would run and swapped back and forth and ran down the hill 16 miles until we could get, it, get him to a, a place where a, a helicopter could take him to a hospital. So um, again, you don't know when those sorts of things are going to arise. Um, but the, at the end of the day, the most important thing is you don't want to be one of these burial stones. You don't want this to be the last memory your uh, family and friends have of you. And so the, the most important thing I can give you is once you've decided, once everything's right, once you've made your plan, you've got to move quickly, expeditiously. Um, I don't know how many of you ever have surf at all, but when you surf, you push the board along, you get ready, you catch a wave, and you've got to come up onto it instantly. And if you are hesitate and you do it slowly, you're going to tumble, you're going to fall, you're not going to get up there. Um, and, in life, I mean, that's the first time you say I love you to somebody, there's that moment of irreversible commitment. And if you can embrace it and seize it, then you can succeed. And my best example of this is going to be with paragliding. 
Um, paragliding is one of the most wonderful things you can do. I learned to do it in uh, Himalayas. And if you guys haven't tried it, I mean, people have wanted to fly throughout human history. And it's, you can do it. It's not that difficult. Uh, it's not that expensive. Uh, it just takes a little training and you're flying. That's looking down and you can choose where you want to go. Um, but you can't hesitate when you launch. You're launching yourself up into space. So this friend of mine, we were learning together. And see how he's slow and he's hesitant. He's not sure. He doesn't believe that he can do it. And so he just, he's bouncing along. He trips and he rolls and tumbles. And you can't hesitate. You have to believe in what you're doing and doing it. And so I saw what he, his mistake. And when I, it was my turn, I said, uh-oh, this is my first time ever paragliding, my first launch. Pull it up. I run. I push as hard as I can. And I just jump. And that's what it takes, that kind of commitment. When you know what your dream is, you have to embrace it. Because your focus is what's going to determine whether or not you succeed. You've got to keep moving forward when you're on that knife edge of red. Again, because you don't know when the storm is going to arise. The storms come. I've been in the mountains so many times, and they've crept up where you're suddenly inundated with snow. Sometimes you have to retreat, and you've got to recognize that moment and uh, do it if you have to, but hopefully you can keep moving forward. With the crevasse, I mean, all these things I've talked about, uh, hopefully you saw in that crevasse video. When I was laying there, immediately I said, you heard me talking to the camera. Can I go this way? No, I can't go that way. Can I go this way? Well, it's slippery. Can I go this way? Maybe I can. What's what, my arm? I can't move my arm, but my, this arm seems to be working. My leg is working. Constantly thinking about what was working, what I had to, to do, um, once I realized there was no way, other way out, no one was coming to rescue me, I had no other choices, I didn't hesitate. I began to move. I began to really focus on what I was doing. And so I made it out here today. So hopefully those lessons are, um, uh, are those ideas all make sense to you. And so what I want to do to finish up things is I want to take you on a successful expedition. I've talked a lot about all the bad things that can happen. Let's talk about some of the good things that can happen. And so I'm going to talk about Mount Everest, uh, climbing Mount Everest from the Tibet. Um, so I climbed uh, Mount Everest in 2010, and uh, Tibet's the more dangerous side, um, but it's also the more beautiful side, I think, in a lot of ways. And um, I love this picture because we were driving down the road approaching it, this tractor was the only vehicle we saw all day. And this is Mount Everest. You're just driving down the road, and right in front of your face, you see the world's tallest mountain. That's the North Ridge we were going to climb. Um, the thing with uh, Mount Everest is I've talked about how there, um, you have to worry about the Asian monsoon. And so when the monsoon starts, snowfall comes, and you can't climb. But on the other hand, you can't climb before the monsoon either. The problem is, is these winds, you can see they're kind of whipping over the mountain, those are 100, 200, 300 mile an hour winds. They literally pick people up and blow them onto another mountain. Um, and so there's about a 10 day window before the beginning of the Asian monsoon when the winds just die. And during that slight time period, that's when you're going to be able to actually climb the mountain. Um, so we aim for that window, again, you study the environment, you scan, you plan. Um, we begin moving through Tibet. We get to our base camp. So we started out, these are our three little tents. So you have a lot of rich teams that are big teams, and I'll show you more about them later. Again, I was climbing with my friends, the Sherpas, and a couple of people that uh, they were friends with as well. Uh, Ed, the guy who was talking to the camera, his wife is a doctor who worked at Everest Base Camp. He's a British um, person, he was climbing with me. And then we had another guy, his name was Kenny from Hong Kong. He got up to advanced base camp and the capillaries in his eyes burst, so he went blind. And thankfully we were able to get him down quickly enough and uh, the capillaries could recover and about a year later he had total regain, re totally regained his sight. Um, but again, lots of dangers potentially. So this is base camp. So we held our, uh, held our puja. Again, well, you can see our equipment to bless it and everything. And then we're looking at Mount Everest. You can see the winds whipping off of it. So we begin moving upward. One of the things I was doing was, because I'm doing research, I took uh, the 1930s accounts of the British climbers 
uh, George Mallory and a lot of other people and looked at what they had found. And all of this was ice when they were there. All of this was snow. Um, these are, I don't know if you can see, there's a little tiny yellow here. Those are those tents I just showed you. That's our base camp. Um, the ice was 100 feet thick, 200 feet thick, 300 feet thick back in the 1930s. This is over a mile of ice that's totally disappeared. So one of the things I was doing was climbing up each of these valleys to see if there were any glaciers left hidden in any of these. And there was a glacier here, there was a glacier here. These two glaciers were totally gone. And so studying how the environment's changing over time. Then we begin moving upward and again, collecting more data. Um, as part of your climbing permit in Tibet, you get two yaks. And so two of these were my yaks with uh, some of my equipment. But I was also carrying my own gear. I had the science stuff. I had the computers. And so most people carry 50 pounds, 60 pounds. Unfortunately, because we're collecting snow samples, ice samples, our computers, we're carrying 100 pounds or more. Um, so that you go up to uh, Camp 2. So this is about eight miles up. You go a little higher, you begin to see Mount Everest up there, the climbers down here, and then you reach advanced base camp. And so this is where Dippin's appendix burst. And so all that terrain we just came up had to run him back down. And you can see it's very disorganized. Once you get to base camp, the haves and the have-nots really begin to express themselves. Again, we were, I'm a professor, I don't have much money, so uh, we were traveling very inexpensively. Um, but some of the uh, rich teams had 100-foot long tents with plasma TVs. They had couches. They were eating steak and pizza. Um, so Everest can be a very luxurious experience if you have $70,000, which is typically what most people are going to spend uh, on it. So um, we, on the other hand, again, we're, here's our little tents. <laughs> we're sort of the outskirts. But um, again, it... Uh, it was nice because it allowed us to easier access to the ice for collecting water, for example. Uh, and you spend a lot of time acclimatizing here. I'm testing out my suit to see how well it fits, make sure everything's ready uh, as we get ready to move up the mountain. Uh, we spend a lot of time digging drainage ditches. Even though we're at 18,000 feet, the mountain is melting around us. The glaciers are melting around us. And so we had to dig these diversion ditches so the water stayed away from our tent. Uh, again, climate change is stunning at these elevations. People always ask, well, what did you eat if you weren't eating steak and pizza? Fried spam, cabbage, carrots, spam ground up and put into a shell. Um, so that was kind of our typical cuisine for most days. So this is where that advanced base camp is. These are all data points that I collected on the way up. So you move, we climb through here to uh, Camp 1, which is about here. Camp 2, and I'll show you all these places, Camp 3. Then from Camp 3, you go up to the summit, back down to Camp 2, and then from Camp 2, back to base camp. So this is how we're going to move up the mountain, how we're going to climb Mount Everest. Um, I showed you this picture or the video before. So you climb up here. This is to get the South Pole. Originally, we were climbing this way because it's the easiest way up, but this uh, avalanched. It's never avalanched in the history of Mount Everest. This was the first time ice had fallen off the mountain. Snow has melted before in the past, but never ice. And so the world, again, changing right in front of us, and it killed people. I sat and watched two Hungarians get swept away by this. Um, really difficult time, so we, of course, learned to go this way around the uh, risk area. Um, the climbing is very steep through this ice field, very physical. Uh, again, we're carrying 80-pound packs, so you can see how slowly everybody's moving. Uh, you literally just stand there watching the clouds move overhead, trying to catch your breath. It's a very slow, cumbersome process moving up the mountain. And I really feel bad for the Sherpas trying to uh, supply the goods for the, people, uh, for the rich people higher up the mountain. Uh, here you can see they're carrying, these are carpets and couches and other things up to these high elevation camps. Uh, it's incredible the, the, what's you know, the difference between the uh, haves and the have-nots and what the Sherpas have to do to supply those uh, demands. So you get up to Camp 1, and uh, we sort of hide behind a little ridge right here. And so from Camp 1, you move up this um, ice field. A little bit back, better picture of that. So you're going to we climb up through this. Camp 2 is about here. Uh, camp 3, you can't really see it's hidden up in here. And then we're going to get on that ridge and follow it to the actual summit. 
As we get closer, get through the ice field, get closer to Camp 2, it's more steep, more difficult climbing. Um, this, back in the 1930s, again, looking at the old British expeditions, this was all covered with snow and ice. And the world has changed in, right in front of us. And um, so these were our tents. And again, this is my friend Ed. And you can see how sloped they are. That's not a function of the way I'm holding the camera. You know, Ed is upright. Uh, the tents were sloped like that. My feet were dangling off into space. I only had, a, uh, I was only down to about the middle of my thighs before the uh, end of the tent. So uh, very difficult conditions, but the views just make it worth it. You know you're reaching your dream. I'm coming closer and closer to fulfilling one of my life dreams. And again, as you move higher, it gets even steeper and more difficult. Um, this is the reason more people tend to die on this side of the mountain. The other side, people die in avalanches. Here, people just die of exhaustion because it gets steeper and harder the higher you go, the less oxygen you have to work with. Um, again, this is climate change. I'm at, you know, I've got oxygen on. I didn't start using that until over 8,000 meters. So I'm at 25, 26,000 feet. I'm almost as high as airplanes fly. I got bare hands, no hat on. I just have a T-shirt on. My pants are unzipped, and so I'm trying to get a breeze through. It's hot, even though, again, I'm at these incredible elevations. The world is changing around us, and that's why we go out and do what we do. Um, one of the things you learn about logistics is to make sure you have the right food. We took some Indian food up in these little packages because it was cheaper. We thought, oh, yeah, we'll be great with Indian food. We took it up to Camp 1 and ate it for a day and a half, and then we spent the next two and a half days over the crevasse pooing every four hours. It just totally it didn't fit your stomach right. And so we learned, all right, it's worth it to spend a little extra and get the good food. So again, these uh, little logistics <laughs> lessons goes a long way towards your success or failure. So this is Camp 3. This is the highest campsite on Earth. It's just camping here. You're above all but about 15 mountains on Earth. Um, this is 27,000 feet. And again, there was snow and ice when the uh, British were originally here. So you keep moving up, and then eventually you reach that ridge I pointed out. And so moving along the ridge, you can see it doesn't look that difficult. It's not super easy. There's some cliffs. There's a lot of tattered ropes. So you think, oh, this isn't too bad. But looking at the ridge, there's this big ship's prow. And this was the thing that scared the British from the beginning of when they started climbing and um, still scares people to this day. I mean, this is a really difficult climb. It's called the second step. The cliff I just showed you is called the first step. Then there's this thing called the third step. Then after you get through it, you've got to climb the snow field up and around. So even once you get onto the ridge, you're still not safe. You still have things you've got to deal with. And uh, so you reach the second step. And I'll just go ahead and make a preface here now. I didn't get this warning when I was on Mount Everest, but I'm going to give it to you guys. Um, there's dead bodies and in the rest of these pictures. So if you don't want to see dead bodies, you might want to avert your gaze. But there's no way around them. And when I got up there, I was ecstatic. I was so happy. I was on the summit ridge. It was Mount Everest, my dream. And suddenly I saw dead people. I'm There's a ladder to help you get through the second step. You're moving along thinking, all right, I'm, I'm doing this. It's not that hard. I can do it. Um, and the entire time, or once you're cruising along right here, you look, and at your feet is a dead person. And what's worse, is they're still tied into the rope. So if you fall, the rope's not going to save you. You're weak. You're um, at your limit. And suddenly it all becomes real. You recognize that this is a life and death type of dream that you're pursuing. And then you reach the third step. And at this point, um, I had left the, my, uh, the Sherpa I was climbing with and the other Sherpa were helping the British guy and I was out in front sort of leading the way, again, trying to collect as much data as possible. So I get to this third step and I wasn't sure how to get around it. And I saw someone sitting there and I thought, oh, this person's sitting here. I'll just talk to him and ask him where to go. And this should tell you something about how addled your brain is at this elevation because clearly this person isn't just sitting there. And in fact, when I talked to uh, the uh, 
Sherpas and my friends, when I got back down, they actually knew this guy. They'd climbed with him three or four years before. And he had summited with them. And his girlfriend had been waiting down in base camp. And he had talked to her on the phone and said, yeah, I summited. Oh, this is so wonderful. And they were all descending together. And they got to the bottom of his third step. And he said, I'm, you know, I'm, this is the most wonderful thing in my life. I've realized my dream. I'm just going to sit here for five minutes, take it all in. I'll catch up to you guys. And they never saw him again. I mean, I can't imagine what that did to his girlfriend just waiting on. He just summited. Where's he at? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. And that, again, seeing this was one of the most shocking things on the mountain for me. Um, you get through the third step, and now this is that summit ridge. Um, and this is one of the worst parts because you have to almost step over a body. And he's been freeze-dried. And these bodies are difficult. I would like to speak past it for you all. Um, and so it's very difficult. Um, but at the same time, these people were pursuing their dreams. And so then you get to the summit. And this is the summit. This is 12,000 foot drop. I can take a snowball and throw it 12,000 feet on this side. On this side, there's a little bit of a ridge and then it drops off 8,000 feet. So the mountain itself is this tiny, tiny little pinprick and you can uh, fly on either side. So here, getting a little closer, you can see the people up on the summit now. Stop, take a breath. Um, you can see how the ice, this is coming from my breath as I breathed out. It caked the front of my uh, jacket. Again, I'm hot, so I had to literally break it open in order to keep moving forward. Uh, getting closer to the summit, people always ask me, is the sky really that dark? Yeah, I mean, you're in the stratosphere. You're right on the edge of the troposphere and stratosphere. You're approaching outer space, and it changes the way the sky looks. When you look back on where we've climbed, so this was the ridge we had just climbed, looking out over Tibet, um, you can see a huge part of the world from up there. And then you actually reach the summit itself, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful experience. Again, one of my life's dreams realized. I pushed through all the hardship. I pushed through the risks. I learned the skills I needed. I figured out from experience not to eat Indian food on the way up. All those things contributed to the success. I went down and I was collecting data on both sides, so I went down on the Nepal side, and all the climbers were coming up from the south, and I just love this because I looked back and saw the Nepal climbers. It was really funny. People who came from Nepal stayed on the Nepal side of the border because the Everest is the border. All the people who came up from the N Tibet side stayed on the Tibet side. I'm the only one who crossed. And so these were all uh, people on the south side um, celebrating in their uh, triumph. So this is the summit of Mount Everest. Just looking towards Nepal. So at that point, the wind's blowing not that bad, 30 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour. The temperature's about minus 30 below zero. Um, that's Fahrenheit, not Celsius. Um, so very, very cold conditions, uh, even on a sunny day on the summit. Um, this is looking down now, so some pictures of around the world just to give you a sense. This always excites me because I'm standing on the summit of Everest and I'm looking at the fourth highest peak on Earth, that's Lhotse. I turn my head slightly, maybe. And um, I can see the sixth highest peak on Earth, Makalu. I can see the third highest peak on Earth, Kanchengchunga. You're in this land of giants, and you're on top of the biggest giant. And again, that's why it's always been so wonderful for me. Um, looking at Choyoyo, which is the eighth highest peak on Earth. Um, one thing is, I know some of the people in the audience uh, have climbed Kalapatar. Kalapatar is a major trekking peak in Nepal. And this is Kalapatar. Kalapatar is on the shoulder of Pumori. So you can just get a sense of scale. And this is a huge, almost 6,000 meters, uh, almost 20,000 feet, like 18, 19,000 feet. So very, very high up. And you're, it seems so incredibly far down from the summit. This is what you look like when you reach the summit. This selfie is not a pretty picture, but uh, again, very difficult to choose. But at the same time, I'm just so excited to be there and to have summited. Right after I summited, this storm moved in. And a few people summited the next day. Um, unfortunately, several of those who did summit died. 
um, because it became very difficult to move forward. So uh, we were able to make it down safely. Most everyone made it down safely. So everyone always asked me, what do you get when you climb Mount Everest? Well, you get a certificate of completion from the Chinese-Tibetan Mountaineering Association. This is my diploma for graduating Mount Everest. So again, I realized my dream um, with all these lessons. Hopefully that these have been informative for you guys. You've gotten something out of it. Again, the key is just to have fun. Enjoy being out there. Um, whatever your dream is, uh, to really enjoy it. So any questions?